Good afternoon and welcome to today's electronic design and microwaves and RF webcast. Our topic today, fundamentals of radiated susceptibility, focusing on requirements, equipment, and application, sponsored by AR RF Microwave Instrumentation. I'm David Maliniak with Endeavor's Design and Engineering Group. To begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply type your issue into the Ask a Question box and a member of our team will assist you. You can also click on the question mark help button in the upper right corner of the screen. Additionally, we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your questions into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. Also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Electronic Design and Microwaves and RF websites within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now let's meet today's speaker. Dean Landers is the Supervisor of Applications Engineering for AR RF Microwave Instrumentation. He's actively engaged in new application and product development, system development and integration, customer support, and training with hardware demonstrations for both customers and AR personnel. Before working at Amplifier Research, Dean spent nine years as an EMC test engineer at Retlif Testing Laboratories, managing military commercial aviation and commercial test programs, writing customer test procedures, and working with customers to help them understand their compliance needs and requirements. Dean also serves as the chair of the executive committee of the Philadelphia IEEE EMC Society chapter. So now let me turn things over to our presenter. Dean, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and welcome uh, everyone to today's presentation. Uh, once again, my name is Dean Landers, and I'm the Supervisor of Applications Engineering here at AR. And uh, I think that the little bio that David uh, gave pretty much explains it all. Uh, and today, uh, we're going to be talking about really just the fundamentals of radiated susceptibility. When you go into a test lab, and you see a bunch of equipment and antennas and all these boxes and things, uh, the only thing that you're you may know when you walk in the first time is that everything looks really expensive, uh, but you really don't may not have an understanding of what's actually going on. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about um, uh, requirements. We're going to talk about uh, the kind of products that you might test and what industry you're in, how those test requirements can define uh, some of the equipment that you'll see uh, used during tests. And if you work in a test lab, um, you're going to uh, maybe understand a little bit more about why certain equipment is, is chosen. Um, we're going to talk about knowing your test equipment and the appropriate uses for it. Um, and we're going to discuss on how to select the proper test equipment for specific testing needs. Uh, and that includes amplifier sizing, uh, for power. Now that uh, we'll touch on amplifiers and antennas and things like that, but we may jump in and, and discuss other types of equipment like surge generators and things like that, uh, and definitely signal generators. Uh, we'll uh, briefly talk about frequency ranges of test equipment, uh, the concerns for cables, connectors, and other factors, and um, we'll talk about some of the applications and what to look for. Uh, while you're testing, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion at the end about uh, safety in a test laboratory, what to do, what things have, have uh, some things that happened to me uh, when I worked in the test lab, and how you can avoid uh, certain situations. So let's kind of get into this. Um, when we're testing products for compliance, we have a typically have a test standard that we're testing to, whether that test standard be something called mill standard 461 or RTCA V160 or any of the many uh, IEC standards that are out there for product types uh, and some of the ISO standards that may even test automotive uh, vehicles. Uh, what happens is those test standards are always really changing. And the people that decide on what to put in test standards or what to remove from test standards are committees. 
And those committees such as uh, G46 or RTCA or the IEC product technical committees uh, write test standards, they develop test approaches, and they define requirements. And a lot of this comes from the tribal knowledge that those people have who've been in the industry, who know uh, how to perform testing and uh, what phenomenon will be present in certain environments. Uh, the individual test standards are updated by uh, the committees as needed. Usually there's some type of uh, turnaround time or, or update uh, period for when things get updated, and the committees try to stick to those closely as possible, those timing guidelines. And then when the updates to the test standards occur, um, they need to be reviewed, and they get, re be, they get reviewed by the users, such as your manufacturers, uh, test laboratories, um, those technical people, and, and others to ensure uh, the equipment, the test environment, and <clears throat> the standard itself continues to meet the needs of uh, the products that are being tested. For example, the G46 committee talks about, um, they discussed mill standard 461, and um, in the most recent edition of 461, they decided to put in a lightning test and electrostatic discharge test because there's phenomenon in the environment of military equipment that exposes um, equipment to that stimulus. So they needed to put that in their test standard. Uh, previously, they just used other test standards as guidance uh, and put that into procurement specifications, but now it's actually in mill standard 461. Um, the way these test standards get updated other than with the committees is they take an in input from the industry uh, that input comes from the manufacturers, comes from test laboratories, and it comes from technical experts. So when a committee decides that they're going to up, update something, uh, they'll request some feedback, they'll request comments, and then they'll go through an update process. Then they'll send out a draft specification, get it reviewed, request comments from the industry out there, and then uh, finalize the test. And it's usually a pretty lengthy iterative process. Um, in certain cases, they will remove, those committees will remove uh, certain equipment from use. Uh, for example, uh, mill standard does not allow uh, the use of circular polarized antennas. In the last edition of mill standard 461, they also removed a test called CS106, which is a conductive susceptibility test, because it was no longer needed, according to the technical committee. So as those test standards get updated, what does that really mean for you as a manufacturer or you in a test laboratory? Um, when something gets updated, uh, certain equipment um, or test approach may change, uh, requiring the uh, purchase of new equipment. For example, if you were a more mill standard 461 test house and uh, they include lightning, and electrostatic discharge, and you don't have any of that equipment, uh, you're going to have to go get it, and it can be a major, major investment. Now, if you were testing mill standard 461, and you were testing RTCA D0160, and some other things as a fully functioning test lab, you may have already had that, so you just have to make sure that your new equipment meets the requirements of the new standard. Um, Another thing that when a uh, test standard gets updated, the laboratory or, or even you as the manufacturer should review the test standard in full to ensure that you still meet the requirements. And if you don't do that, you can run into a terrible situation. Uh, when I was in the test lab, we had a customer, a very, very good customer of ours, who uh, developed the product and they sent it to France. This was a commercial product, and what happened was during the shipment of, uh, during the manufacturing, somewhere between the manufacturing and the shipment, uh, the EMC directive was recast, and it went into effect. And they were uh, subject to testing to IEC or EN 61326. And in the meantime, that standard got reharmonized to a newer version. The update to that test standard was that the requirements for uh, radiated immunity increased from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.7, and the ESD requirements uh, went up in, uh, in test level. They increased. 
So everything gets into the customs doc and they have the wrong declaration of conformity. Uh, they update the declaration of conformity, then they find out that they didn't meet all the requirements of the new test standard. So what did they have to do? They had to bring everything into the laboratory and get the test reports updated, get new test reports so they can then go in uh, to a new declaration of conformity and then get the thing shipped into France. This took them months and they had hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment just sitting in customs um, for, a, for the reason that all they needed to do was pay attention to the requirements of their, of their equipment and, and they missed it and it cost, it cost them in the long run. Um, so as a manufacturer, uh, make sure that you are always abreast of what is changing in your compliance rules. And as a uh, test laboratory, you need to uh, ensure that other scope, your scope of accreditation, your ability to directly perform a test, uh, or your knowledge and expertise um, gets evaluated when this test standard comes out. Um, examples of test standards adding and changing test requirements, like I said, uh, no standard 461. Um, CS117, which is lightning, and CS118, which is electrostatic discharge, for some labs to increase their capabilities. And RTCA D0160, which is the test standard for uh, commercial aviation. Think of your airplanes that are in the air, Boeing, Airbus, those guys typically base their, their test standards on D0160. Um, that allowed for the placement of the radiating antenna further than one meter from the EUT allowing test laboratories to decrease their test time by effectively uh, using a wider beam width if, the, if they had enough RF power. So that's just a couple examples of test standards being updated to allow uh, or change the test requirements or allow test laboratories to uh, do some different type of test approach. Um, So as you look into a test standard, you need to understand the appropriate use of your test equipment uh, and the considerations that you need to um, the considerations that you need to make during the selection of your equipment are uh, there's a couple of different things. You make sure that the uh, that the that the device that you're actually using to perform the test um, is applicable to that specific test standard. Are you even allowed to use it? Is the uh, if you're doing um, radiated emissions, for example, in MIL standard 461, uh, make sure that your antenna meets the size requirements, the aperture requirements. Um, if there's a harmonic requirement for your amplifier, you need to ensure that the for radio susceptibility testing, you need to ensure that your amplifier meets the harmonic requirement. You need to make sure that it makes a meets the frequency range of operation. Uh, if you have, if you're testing uh, RS-103, radiated susceptibility, up to 18 gigahertz, you can't use a 6 gigahertz amplifier uh, for a top end to get to 18. So you need to ensure that you have the right equipment to get there. Um, you also need to uh, ensure that the, the output power and the power handling of everything in your chain, specifically, for radiated susceptibility testing or, or, or any uh, susceptibility test, but specifically radiated or conductive susceptibility, you need to ensure that your amplifier power is actually the weakest power in the chain. So if you have a 250 watt amplifier, your directional coupler needs to be rated higher than 250 watts, and your antenna needs to be rated than 250 watts. Or if they're not rated that high, you run the risk of damaging them and putting yourself uh, down and not being able to actually run the test later. So you need to understand the appropriate use of the test equipment. Um, and you also don't want to use an amplifier or some other piece that is actually too powerful. If you have a 10 volt per meter test, which is a pretty low level, and you only and you have the choice between using a 500 watt amplifier and a 10,000 watt amplifier, which do exist, you'll want to use the 500 because you only need to generate a small field. If you're trying to develop a 200 volt per meter test level or a higher at a low frequency, 
uh, you may need that 10,000 watts. You may need 5,000 watts. So ensure that you're using appropriate test equipment for the test. And uh, when we talk about frequency range, we need to make sure uh, during these types of tests that the frequency range of the test equipment is uh, we're going to be using during the test, excuse me, let me repeat that. The frequency range of the equipment that we have needs to be stay within the range of the test. So if we're going up to six gigahertz for radio susceptibility test, don't use a four gigahertz amplifier. Use something that goes up to six. You may have to use more than one amp. Um, depends on what the equipment is in the, in the laboratory. Um, so we're going to, we have a test, we have some test requirements, and we're going to select the proper test equipment for our specific testing needs. Uh, so it's important to uh, use the correct size of the equipment. Um, so if we have a high gain horn and we're testing five or 10 volts per meter, we may have trouble controlling the RF field at that low level. Um, or if we have if we have a, um, a high gain horn or a, a standard gain horn that we're trying to meet 200 volts per meter, um, we may have trouble getting there. So um, our measure versus our theory, theoretical field strength of antennas need to be taken into account to ensure that uh, we don't overshoot or undershoot uh, our test level. Uh, be wary of the power rating of your amplifier, a very uh, common uh, Rating of an amplifier is P1dB, and you should see that on every data sheet uh, for your amplifier that's out there. Um, and that is uh, important for testing where amp amplifier linearity is a concern. Your IEC 61, 61,000-4-3 uh, has a very tough uh, linearity requirement that if you have a, an amplifier that is not, that is on the, um, it's kind of marginal for meeting field, uh, you may, run the risk of not meeting your linearity requirements. Um, be, uh, know what the 3 dB beam width of your antenna is, uh, and you want that to be wide enough to illuminate your EUT. And, if, and when I say EUT, I mean equipment under test. Uh, if you have a, a large test sample and a narrow beam width of an antenna, you will have to run multiple positions for testing radiated susceptibility to ensure that the entire uh, surface of the EUT is covered during the test. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the required modulations um, are met by our signal generator. Uh, if we have an amplitude modulation or a pulse modulation uh, for our test, which are two common modulations for radiated susceptibility, we need to ensure that that has that our signal generator has that capability. If it doesn't, or you are not 100% sure uh, prior to the test, you probably need to connect that um, signal generator into some type of analyzer signal or or a um, spectrum analyzer to make sure that you can see that modulation happening and that it would meet the requirement of the test standard. Uh, another thing that You'll, you'll need to do is always try to build conservative losses into your power and field strength calculations. If you know that your antenna takes 200 watts to make a certain field and you have at the high frequency of the test, you have 3 dB of cable loss, you're going to need more power than 200 watts from the amplifier because some power is going to be lost in your cable. We're going to touch on that a little bit more as we go on. Uh, the other thing that you're running to is chamber effects. EUT effects, uh, like I said, cable losses, everything is going to play a factor into meeting the requirements of your test, uh, your field level typically. So uh, that's something that, that will wreak havoc on sometimes meeting field if your chamber has issues or you have an EUT that's causing a lot of reflections and uh, other issues. Uh, you, your, your probe placement may need to change. Uh, your antenna placement may need to change. It depends on. It de really depends on the on the on the test setup itself. So a lot of people will use this equation. Um, 
on how to know what amplifier size to use, this equation has an issue. Uh, the issue here is that the gain that is listed in uh, underneath the root of the equation, that gain is a far field gain. And when we're doing EMC testing, um, that gain, we are typically testing in the near field. So when you run this equation to, to see how much power you may need for a certain field strength, which is measured in volts per meter at a certain distance, this equation can be used as a guide. It is not to be used as a tried and true, uh, we will make field based on this equation because this, this equation is based on the near field and not the far field. Uh, or sorry, this equation is based on the far field and we're testing in the near field. It's good to get a, use it as a guide, but understand that you may run into problems later. So, we have a set of antennas and we have uh, a set of equipment. Uh, how do we know what antenna to use in a certain immunity test? First of all, we need to meet the requirements of the test. If there, there may be physical size limitations, there may be visual limitations, there may be frequency limitations. Um, for example, if we talk about size, physical size limitation, um, if we use, uh, if we're testing ISO 11452-2, Two, which is a radiated susceptibility test for automotive, um, and you want to use a really, really big antenna to meet a, a field strength at a low frequency, and we're using a, uh, a log periodic, if you use a very large antenna, the requirements of the test standard state that the antenna, the center of the antenna shall, shall be a certain height, and if you have to and you make that antenna turn vertical, it also has a requirement that the antenna has to be a certain height off of the floor. So if you have too big of an antenna, you're either going to be too high uh, for your the center of your antenna, or you're going to be too close to the floor. So you got to you got to make sure that you use an antenna that meets both of those requirements when you're in the vertical polarization. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we can handle the power applied from the amplifier. If we have a uh, if we're doing an IEC test. Uh, a biconalog hybrid antenna is a very common uh, antenna to use. Some of those that are out there uh, are not rated for high enough power. And if we use that antenna, we run the risk of uh, destroying it if we have too powerful of, of an amplifier. So know how much power you need and, and know the limitation of the, of the antenna itself. Um, also want to make sure that the beam width and coverage area is sufficient, that it's wide enough to cover the equipment under test and your cable exposure requirements. Uh, typically in MIL standard 461, and I, I know I'm jumping around test standards a lot, but um, and if anybody has questions about uh, the certain test standards that I'm uh, talking about here, feel free to reach out to me and I can uh, discuss it with you. However, uh, if we have a certain coverage with uh, for 461 and the uh, we have a three meter test setup. That uh, includes the uh, the cables and the EUT, and uh, for 460 in, in middle standard 461, you have your EUT, and you have to have the first two meters of cable exposed along the front edge of the test setup. Uh, up to 200 megahertz, you have to test the entire width of the test setup. So a three meter, four meter, five meter, six meter, okay, and then it gives you definitions on what antennas to use or the, the, the width of the antennas and their placement. Okay, now at, when we get above 200 megahertz, it requires the EUT, physical size of the EUT surface, plus the first 35 centimeters of cable from 200 megahertz to a gig. So we gotta make sure that our antenna can cover that. And if it can't, uh, we will have to do multiple antenna positions uh, because you know a typical, uh, horn antenna from 200 megahertz to a gig is about 70 centimeters, 60 to 70 centimeters at one meter distance. So if I have a larger EUT plus the first 35 centimeters of cable, I may need more than one antenna position and that's pretty common. So understand that you might have to do this multiple times. Uh, you have to, might have to do multiple antenna positions. Um, and if you're testing IEC 61000-4-3, which requires a uniform field area, 
your uh, uniform field area um, is a meter and a half by one meter and a half. So you have, uh, there's a grid and, and, and some other things that you have to do, but your antenna beam width um, needs to be wide enough so that you can get a uniform field across the entire test setup uniform field area. So different test standards require different types of coverage areas. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, a, a radiated susceptibility or radiated immunity test setup uh, size example. Uh, so um, we're going to talk about the uh, equipment size, the, the amplifier antennas and things like that. Uh, and this example is really based on MIL standard 461 or DO 160 because they're very, very, very similar. The equipment that you use is nearly identical from MIL standard 461 and um, DO 160. So we need to have a plan, we need to get our antennas together, and what amplifiers are we going to use? Uh, so the the chart that you see there is a, um, a measured value based on uh, based on field strengths that we have measured based on input into an antenna. So our first, we're going to work above a gigahertz. We're going to go one to eighteen, uh, and we are going to start with a high gain horn that covers from eight hundred megahertz to six gigahertz. And on the next slide, you'll be able to see. It's a lot clearer, but um, that horn that we're going to use theoretically uh, requires just over 100 watts to generate 200 volts per meter. Now, understand that these measurements were taken in free space. They were not taken in the chamber, and they were not taken in uh, over a ground pipe. They were taken on in an open area test site, essentially. So to cover that, we need to size for at least 200 watts. To accommodate for our losses and unforeseen circumstances, testing over a ground plane, testing inside of a chamber. Um, so our best amplifier solution is going to be uh, 200 to 200 watts of RF power, and uh, that that is really a 3 dB uh, margin. You'll hear people talk about 3 dB margins and things like that. So uh, you. If you need 100 watts, understand that you might, by the, the effects that you see in your test setup, you might need 200 or more. So uh, this um, chart here, you can look at, uh, it's logarithmic, so just above 100 is, is the 200 line, and 100 watts starts right at one gigahertz. So that was 100 watts of power calculated. We're gonna add 3 dB to that, which is a double in the size of the power, and that's gonna take us up to 200. So hopefully, with, if you have that horn, you have a 200 to 250 watt amplifier, and you should not have too much problem meeting 200 volts per meter. Our next antenna in our example here is uh, covers the 6 to 18 gigahertz range. Like I said, with this example, we're just working from 1 to 18, but we're going to break it up into two pieces. Our next antenna covers 6 to 18. And that requires just over 20 watts to generate 200 volts per meter. So just like in the previous uh, frequency range, we're going to size our amplifier for 40 watts uh, to accommodate the uh, unforeseen circumstances, chamber effects, cable losses, and things like that. The cable loss is going to increase pretty rapidly once we get above uh, 8 to 10 gigahertz. Cable loss is going to go up, but the gain of the antenna is also going to go up. Beam width is going to narrow. Uh, so based on all that, we're going to size for a 40 watt amplifier. Um, if our cable lengths are excessive and we don't have really good cables in our lab uh, or in our test setup, we're going to have to maybe even increase the power. You might have to go up 75 or 100 watts um, to reach your 200 volt per meter level. And there's the chart uh, there in front of you that shows um, uh, if, you, if you download the, uh, the presentation later, you can zoom in on this. Uh, but 200 watts, or sorry, 200 volts per meter, you're going to be right at 20 watts. So we're going to go to a 40 watt amplifier there. And I'm sure that people are out there making jokes that I work for an amplifier company and we always want to sell the biggest amplifiers out there. That is true, uh, but we want to ensure that you have success. And we, 
don't want you to buy way too much amplifier. We want you to have the right amplifier. Um, so we're talking about frequency range of test equipment. Um, EMC test equipment is always going to have an associated frequency range with it. Uh, if it's a horn, it's going to be broken up into uh, octaves or decades. Uh, typical of, a, of amplifiers are going to be um, broken up in certain uh, ranges. Uh, our here at, at AR, our amplifiers typically typically go from like a 10 kilohertz to 225 megahertz amplifier or 400. Then we have another series that goes from 80 meg to 1 gig. We have another series that goes from 1 to 6 gig, and then we have another series that goes from 6 to 18. And the power ranges vary from 10,000 watts uh, from 80 or uh, 10K to uh, 225 meg to a 20 watt amplifier from 6 to 18, or a 75 watt amplifier from 6 to 18. Uh, depending on your, your needs and everything uh, for your laboratory, um, you'll need the size of the amplifier to uh, test any requirements that you, that you foresee coming in. Um, so the user of your test equipment really needs to be cognizant of the frequency ranges of tests. We can't measure emissions with a spectrum analyzer that only goes up to 6 gig if we have 18 gigahertz emissions to measure. Uh, we can't test below 80 megahertz if our amplifier only goes down to 80. We need another amplifier to get down to you know, 20 or 10 kilohertz. Uh, so uh, make sure that you are cognizant if you're using the test equipment of the frequency range. Um, many times in your test laboratory, the frequency breaks of the equipment do, do not match. And that starts to create a challenge for the user uh, who's doing the actual testing. Um, for example, a laboratory may have two amplifiers with the 1 to 18, just like we talked about, uh, for DO160. And those amplifiers go from 1 to 6 and 6 to 18. But in DO160, you have to measure the power coming off of your amplifier at a pre-calibrated level. Uh, and the directional couplers that in the example here have a 1 to 4 and a 4 to 18. Uh, range because that's what we have in the test lab, right? So the test has to be run in three separate parts. We got to go one to four gig, and then we have to go four to six gig, then we have to go six to 18. The rub here with DO160 is you have to do a pre calibrated test level and play the forward power back that was recorded during your pre calibrated level. Uh, you have to play that back, and then you can't disconnect anything. You have to immediately go into test. So we have to pre-calibrate one to four, then we uh, have to run our tests, then we have to calibrate four to six with our different directional coupler. Now we've run out of amplifier, so we can only go up to the highest frequency of that amplifier. So we go four to six, we run that test, then we, then we switch amplifiers and we go six to 18. So there's multiple steps here, right? So you have to be cognizant of what equipment you have in the lab. Uh, it gets even more hairy when you uh, have uh, multiple signal generators, you have multiple antennas, um, and, and it just gets, it, it, finding it all to fit together is kind of a dance, right? As you put things together, you have to kind of, well, I need this, this directional coupler with this amplifier, but I also have to use it with another amplifier. Uh, and you might have, if you don't have extremely high power amplifiers, you may need uh, to, you may need to use multiple antennas and uh, with high gain with a high gain horn. Uh, the problem with that is that the, the higher the gain in the horn, the usually the the more narrow of a frequency range it has. Uh, so I think in my test laboratory we had something like six or seven antennas to get from one to 18 gig, uh, just to get 200 volts per meter. Now if we were testing a lower lower uh, field level. We could use a double ridge guide and get there the whole way. So uh, understand test equipment and requirements, like I said, the whole time, very important. Um, a quick note on cables, connectors, and uh, some other concerns. Uh, as the frequency range, as the frequency goes up, your cable loss also increases. 
And if you've had any electromagnetic uh, education and you start learning about transmission lines and skin effect and all that, you understand why the cable loss basically goes up as the frequency goes up. Uh, this can re cause the required amplifier power to increase. Um, in our examples previously, we talked about a 3 dB margin or a doubling of power just in the sizing and the margin. If we had excessive cable loss, we may need, if we needed a 40 watt amplifier, we might now need a 60 or a 70 or a 100 because we keep losing power in our cable. Um, so always be sure to evaluate ahead of time how much cable loss you're gonna have in the system from your amplifier output to your antenna input and um, having good cables will make a huge, huge difference. Um, if you don't have, if you have excessive cable loss, it, it, what's gonna happen is you're gonna not meet your uh, field level. And that's a pretty bad day when you can't meet field. Uh, a chart here, and uh, we have uh, placed this in some of our posters and other things, but this chart here gives a, uh, it gives a, a an indication of, of frequency range and of connectors uh, and the power handling of connectors. So if you have an N-type connector, which is very common in a test lab, or B and C connectors, which are pretty common in low frequency situations, um, that chart there kind of explains uh, that how much power a connector can handle at a certain frequency. Um, safety concerns. Uh, I have a couple anecdotal uh, things we can share here, but uh, a, an EMC test laboratory is not a place for people who are inexperienced, unaware, or careless. Uh, if you walk into an EMC test lab, you'll see some very expensive equipment. You will be see you will see uh, chambers that require maintenance. Um, and uh, a, a, a nice environment, a clean environment to, to be maintained. Um, some of the stuff inside of EMC chambers is fragile, like the absorber that's on the wall. Some of that is just foam. And if you touch it, it will start to fall apart. If you keep uh, touching it continuously, uh, you may go into an EMC lab with some older chambers, you'll see that the absorber is all is all beat up and scratched and, 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 and ripped. Um, so it's not a place for somebody who's, who doesn't know what they're doing, who is careless and, and or, um, just not paying attention. Um, the other thing that you'll see in the EMC test lab is exposed terminals with sometimes potentially lethal voltages are sometimes present. Uh, especially on the line impedance stabilization networks. Uh, uh, I remember one time I was in a lab and I, was, I had taken over a test for somebody. It was a 440 volt test system. And this was totally my fault. This was something because I wasn't paying attention. This has nothing, this is not a, um, a, an issue with where I worked. It was what I was doing. Uh, because I walked into a situation I didn't know exactly what was going on. I had a, a large system with a 440 volt input with, um, and the person who had set it up had to go home for the day. So I took over and I was gonna run CS114. I was setting things up while the calibration was running and I went to grab some tools off the test bench, not knowing that the unit was still powered on because it didn't have any indication that it was. And I got my forearm across the uh, two of the 440 volt uh, lizards and it hurt. I was very lucky that my other hand wasn't on the ground plane at the time because I probably wouldn't be talking to you here today. So I got lucky. Um, it happens. There are exposed terminals and usually guards are set up, you know, so people don't walk into them. But this was, I was the one doing the test and I was the one who got, uh, got hit with it. So um, be aware when tests are set up and lizards are there and other exposed terminals that you don't touch them, it doesn't even matter if the power is on or off. Make sure you don't touch those exposed terminals. Um, exposure to RF fields can be dangerous. Um, if you ever get yourself into a situation where there's RF present, uh, sometimes you can actually feel it. Uh, one time we had a, uh, 
uh, I was running a test and I start I stopped making the field. Uh, and it was above 18 gigahertz. We had a, a situation where we were testing 18 to 40 gig, and um, I started not making field. It was a 200 volt per meter test, and I turned everything off. So I thought, went into the room, and rebore sided my antenna because what was happening is the frequency went up sky high towards 40 gig. The beam width of the um, the the antenna shrunk. And my field probe was not in an ideal position, so I just needed to recite in everything. But when I went in there and I recited everything in, we bore sighted, changed my field probe and all that, I felt my hand getting hot. And what was happening was I left the signal generator and amplifier in with RF on and, op and operate. Totally my fault. I thought I turned it off. I didn't. And I go back out, and I saw six or seven hundred volts per meter on the on the field probe because uh, I was blasting it. I had it by like zero dBm going in. Like I said, totally my fault. Um, but I I was in a hurry. I was trying to get the test done, so I felt my hand basically cooking because it was right at the antenna. Um, so know the capability of your equipment and know what state it's in. Know that you're powered off. Know that it's not an operate for your amplifier. And this is really crucial for radiated susceptibility, but it also, it goes for any other test. If you're running surge and it's, a, it's charging up, uh, your generator is charging up, be read, be understanding that that, that surge generator is going to fire. It's going to uh, produce a spike, and that's 2,500 volts. It can hurt you. Um, know that the equipment is often heavy and might require a two-man lift. It might, it, it may be heavy enough that you need two people, especially some of the larger amplifiers that are out there. Uh, so don't try to uh, lift something onto a cart or uh, move it around the lab if it's heavy, um, because one, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to hurt yourself, or two, you're going to drop something. And like I said, everything is expensive, uh, and it will put you down, and you won't be able to test if you drop something. Um, and please, please, please uh, don't do something so careless that you uh, you or somebody becomes a widow or a widower because of the accidents that could have been pre prevented. Um, with the time I got across that lizard, I got lucky and uh, I never, there, not a day goes by that I don't see a lizard and I think to myself, I, that could have been in the end right there. So. Uh, is something to be very, very, very cognizant of. So kind of to wrap things up here, uh, when we are involved in our EMC testing, specifically radiation susceptibility, be aware of the test equipment limitations uh, with your power, with your frequency, and all the other capabilities that equipment can handle. Uh, don't use equipment outside of its intended operating range. Um, the test standard that you are using will define your equipment use to a certain degree. Um, and when uh, sizing amplifiers, be sure to leave in margins so that the chamber effects, cable losses, connector constraints do not adversely affect your test system. And uh, one thing also, always be safe. Always. Uh, uh, be cognizant of what's happening around you, what's happening in your test. Uh, make sure that things are not running away uh, from a from a power and a field standpoint. Uh, that is crucial for um, success in a test laboratory, specifically with radiated susceptibility. And that's what I have for you today. All right. Thank you, Dean. Excellent presentation. A uh, few of you have already submitted questions, so we'll jump into those in a moment. If you would like to submit a question now, just type it into the Ask a Question box and hit the Send button. Also, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. Uh, first question from the audience, Dean, is how do I assess the need to repeat the radiated susceptibility test on an EUT if a component or com and or components have been replaced, things like Wi-Fi modules, LTE modules, or power switching circuits? Ooh. Well, 
Well, that's a loaded question. Um, typically, now the most conservative uh, answer here is that if you change anything, you have to have it retested. Uh, that's not always really possible, right? If you change a resistor, uh, you don't necessarily need to retest and go full compliance. Uh, you may be able to justify certain things to retest when you change something. For example, if you change a power input module on a device and you have technically, according to all data sheets and everything, made it better, you may be able to get yourself away you may be able to get away with just testing some of the all the conducted methods because we're testing directly to the power input there. Um, if you're testing a an internal module like an LTE module, any radio, any active component, any processor, any display, things like that, uh, you're probably looking at going through the full gamut again of all the testing. Um, Keep in mind that um, it, it, it differs between if it's a military uh, device or a commercial aviation device or an automotive device or just a commercial device like a laptop or a cell phone or something like that. All of those have different requirements, right? So it goes back to um, whoever's approving it. If it's a declaration of conformity where you're self-declaring compliance, for the EMC directive out of Europe, then um, you can probably, you can justify retesting certain things. If it's a military product and you change the display on something and it's going into an F-18 aircraft, they're gonna make you wanna do 461 all over again. So it really, I hate to give the answer, it depends, but it depends. It depends on the industry, it depends on the product, it depends on what was changed, and it depends on the end customer. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is uh, sort of sideways related. It's another retesting question. If standards are updated and your product has already passed the previous uh, revision of the standard, do you need to retest? Okay. So that's another, uh, there, we're going to have to talk about different industries here to do this. Now, Let's start in the commercial world. Uh, the EMC directive has a set of harmonized standards and those are product family driven. So for like measurement devices and, and test equipment, your test standard is the IEC or EN 61326, that's the number, dash one. So when that, if that gets updated and a new version gets harmonized, there's a grace period between the end of the, of the um, harmonization of the 2006 version to the 2013 version, okay? Mm -hmm. But when that grace period ends, then all of your products that you're shipping to Europe need to be tested to the new version of the, your test standard, to 61326 in this case. Okay, so that's, that's commercial. And if the requirements change for like the FCC for a transmitter, then you'd have to update those uh, requirements based on the um, you know, your grant of certification and things like that. Now, let's talk about a military product or a, an aviation product. When the procurement specifications are written for uh, a, a piece of military equipment, and that let's say it's for a um, for a, an aircraft carrier, okay? The Gerald Ford aircraft carrier CVN-78 was written to Meet, you had to meet the requirements of MIL standard 461E, okay? Now, if you had a device tested to MIL standard 461E and it complied, it goes on the ship. If, mm -hmm. But after that, MIL standard 461F and MIL standard 461G were released. If you're going to install something on that ship, even today, you have to have it tested to MIL standard 461E because that's what the procurement specification states for that particular uh, vehicle for the military. So it like I said, it depends. It depends on the industry that you're in. Okay, makes sense. Um, all right, 
uh, shift gears. What is the difference between harm, harmonic and range of operation? The questioner says the presenter implied they are different. I'm not sure I quite understand. What, what this, I, I, I'm trying to see it. I don't see it here. Um, uh, there's the difference between harmonic and range of operation. Oh, okay. So the harmonic, so in an amplifier, when you, uh, let's say you have a signal going into, uh, into an amplifier from a signal generator and it's at two gigahertz. The harmonic for that, the first harmonic is two gigahertz, second harmonic would be four, third harmonic would be six, and so on. So every two gigahertz you have a harmonic. And what you'll see if you looked at it on, a, on an analyzer, you'd see a large signal at your fundamental, which is at two gigahertz, and you would see a smaller signal at four, a smaller signal at six, and, and, and you keep going down. What's gonna happen is eventually, those harmonics are going to outrun the frequency range of the amplifier, and it's not going to amplify those harmonics anymore because it, it physically can't. Because it's a, let's say it's a six gig amplifier, you'll see a harmonic at two, you'll see the harmonic at four, you'll see the harmonic at six, and then that's probably it. You probably won't see much more after that. And then all the spurious in, in between there will be pretty low. Uh, we spec our amplifiers that like for the second and third, I think is 20 dB down from the carrier. And then everything else is like minus 50. So you'll see two small spikes after the carrier, and then after that, it, it, it kind of disappears. So there, oh. yeah, there are two different things. The harmonic is yeah. is every, it's just an addition of the frequency, and then the, the, there's a frequency range of the actual amplifier, which basically turns into a filter after that. Okay, got it. Um, the next one is uh, you're you've been asked to. Please explain again the safety hazard with LISN. Well, line impedance stabilization network is a device that acts as a filter and a an impedance normalization for power cables or um, other types of interface cables onto a device. And what that what they do is they ensure that the impedance and the inductance of the line matches what would be out in the installation. Okay, sorry forward. Um, next one is, what do you use to monitor uh, that the correct RF power levels are injected into the antenna over the course of the measurement? We typically use a field probe for that. Uh, if it's a mil standard 461 test, uh, your field probe will um, measure the live field. If uh, if it's a uh, an IEC 61000-4-3 test, you have a uniform field area calibration where uh, where you record the forward power during that calibration and play that back. So you measure that with either a power meter or a spectrum analyzer, mm -hmm. um, maintaining the same test setup that you had during during uh, the calibration. For uh, DO 160, it uh, commercial aviation. Uh, they do a pre-test calibration where uh, you put, you uh, inject the field in the test setup, but that is measured with a field probe. You record the forward power from the amplifier, install the test sample, and then rerun that forward power that you recorded during the calibration. Once again, All it right. depends on the test on the test spec. Yeah, every a lot, a lot of cases are you know things are case sensitive. Um, how is it, how can higher power damage a passive antenna? Well, the components that are inside of, a, of an antenna are, they have some type of power rating. Usually antennas are, are rated pretty high, but if it's, it's, if it's an antenna that's really designed to take measure, um, admissions measurements, uh, it may not have a very strong ballot in it, or some of the other elements may be, uh, they're smaller, so they can be a little bit more sensitive. So if you have a 5,000 watt amplifier going into an, an antenna that is rated at 500 watts, uh, that antenna is not going to work for very long. It's going to get burned up. And mm -hmm. the, the antenna will get physically hot if you have too much power going into it. Yep. 
All right. So touch your antenna. <laughs> what yeah, don't, in don't your touch. Uh, don't okay, don't touch it. In in your opinion, what's the biggest difference between an EMC engineer and an EMC technician? Hmm, okay, so so I'm an EMC engineer, um, and I I was responsible for understanding the test requirements applying them to a certain product in a way that uh, ensured compliance with the test standards. Um, that involved writing test procedures, uh, sometimes setting up a test uh, with people, uh, basically knowing everything behind what is in an EMC test. The technician who actually really does the work uh, is the one who actually applies the test. And the best at technicians make the best engineers. If you're a good technician for uh, for EMC, um, the, and you work in it for a while, maybe five to ten years, you can work yourself into being an EMC test engineer just by experience mm -hmm. alone, um, and pay, really just paying attention to what's going on. Um, it, it, it's really two separate things, but a, a, a good EMC engineer may not be the best EMC technician. A good yeah. EMC technician uh, can learn enough to, to, to be a very powerful EMC engineer. Okay. Gotcha. And uh, here's another one. If you're, if you're testing to MIL standard 461 and you're using modulation for RS-103 test, do you measure the required VM amplitude using uh, CW or with modulation turned on? The way so we did we did this a couple of different ways. Um, if it, if if there was a requirement to show graphical data in the test report, and that that came from certain customers, not not always, because the the requirement in 461 is actually tabular data. So if it was if if, if they required graphical data, what we would do is we would level up CW to our mm -hmm. 200 volt per meter or 100 volt per meter, whatever that whatever the requirement was modulate for the required three seconds or whatever the test sample needed, turn it off, go to the next frequency and, and level up again on CW, turn the modulation on, turn it off, go to the next frequency. If we, if we didn't run uh, that and, and level up CW, and that was to record data, um, but if we didn't have to record that data on the fly and we could do it by, uh, do it live, mm -hmm. Uh, do a live time level, um, we would uh, bring our test level up to 200 volts per meter, for example, CW, turn on the modulation, figure out what the difference was based on our field probe sensitivity, and then run at that test level the whole way. So we did it both. So we did it both. We leveled modulation and we, 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 did, we leveled on modulated if we didn't have to record it, and then we would level uh, CW if we did. Now, uh, okay. AR actually has a new field probe series available that can that can measure a pulse field without any uh, without any uh, CW leveling leveling at all. So that uh, that would be a third option. Okay, good. Uh, we have time for one or two more. Um, will antenna data sheets typically specify the field levels at a given power input? Uh, ours do. Um, not everybody does it that way. I would say maybe half of the antenna manufacturers do. They'll show you, at, you know, if you give it 100 watts, this is, this is the field that you'll get across the frequency range. Maybe half. Uh, you'll, you'll see gain plots more often, but those are typically a far field gain. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing that you'll see is, is uh, sometimes they'll give, the, the, uh, give that at um, – different distances, like a one meter distance and a three meter distance. So you know what kind of power you're looking at if you need to test further out. Okay, and do, do, does a spec, uh, this is my, my, my own question, I, I just wanted to follow up, does a spec like that assume a, an ideal path? Yeah, that would, mostly that's going to assume free space. Free space, yeah, yeah. And that, okay. that, 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 that 
number is measured usually at the antenna, not through the cable. Okay, fair enough. Um, just one more check through the, the queue, and I think we are out of time. So uh, for questions we didn't have time to get to, we'll get back to you via email. And that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design and Microwaves and RF, I'd like to thank Dean for a great presentation in AR RF microwave instrumentation for sponsoring today's event. And of course, all of you for joining. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.